In this video, we are gonna talk about the communication skill of advocacy inquiry. We'll talk about what it is, we'll discuss how to use it, including plenty of specific examples. And finally, I'll tell you why I think it should be your go-to tool the next time you need to exercise graded assertiveness or give difficult feedback. In case you're new here, my name's Hayden Richards. I am an emergency physician and this is Comms Lab. On this channel, I share what I've learned about having difficult conversations. So what is advocacy inquiry? It has three key components. One, an observation of some behavior. Gatsby, I noticed you've relieved yourself on the floor there. Two, a statement of what you might call good judgment. I'm worried that this has happened because you might think this is an okay place to pee now. And three, an inquiry into what might be behind the observed behavior. I'm wondering if you could tell me what was happening for you when, when this took place. Okay, so there's a few things to unpack there. Firstly, what is a statement of good judgment? To define what good judgment is, I'm gonna take a page out of the debriefing literature, in particular, the work of Jenny Rudolph and the team at the Harvard Center for Medical Simulation. They contrast debriefing with good judgment with statements of bad judgment. Bad dog. And statements of non-judgment. Gatsby, I noticed you've relieved yourself on the floor there. I'm just wondering, why you did that? Statements of bad judgment can be pretty damaging for obvious reasons. What's interesting is that even though many people see a non-judgmental attitude as the gold standard when giving feedback, what this usually means in practice is that we're actually trying to hide our judgment. The problem with this is that most of us are not very good at hiding our judgment. In fact, Jenny Rudolph argues that there is no such thing as non-judgmental debriefing. Even though it might not be explicitly stated, our evaluation of the other person's actions will come through in our tone, our facial expressions, and our body language. Just wondering why you did that? The resulting incongruence between our verbal and non-verbal communication can actually be really disorienting for the other person, the person receiving the feedback. Advocacy inquiry solves this problem by including an explicit statement regarding our judgment. In order to maintain psychological safety in the conversation, this is typically framed as a concern or a worry. I'm worried that this has happened because you might think this is an okay place to pee now. So what about the inquiry part? What are we trying to find out here? According to Rudolph, our key priority is to discover what the other person's frames are, what frames they've been using to make the decisions that led to the observed behavior. Frames are the beliefs and, and assumptions that a person carries with them and which color their experience of things and which therefore drive a person's decisions and, and their behavior when they're faced with a given situation. By inquiring into the other person's frames, we might discover a fundamental belief that differs from our own. Well, uh, what do you mean this isn't a good spot? This is the perfect spot. Being outside, is the losers. A miscommunication. Oh, sorry. I thought I heard you say that this is where I should do it. Or a part of the situation that we, as the observer, may have been blinded to. <sighs> Look, it's, it's been a tough week. My back leg's been so sore and it's been difficult to move around. And sometimes I lose control before I get a chance to get outside. Hopefully it's obvious that each of these discoveries would have resulted in a very different conversation ranging from an urgent need to address distorted thinking to a conversation focused primarily on supporting the other person through a difficult time. So where and when can we make use of advocacy inquiry in our day-to-day -day work? Well, it, it clearly has an established role in the debriefing of simulation participants. But I think its value extends far beyond that. We could use it to initiate a conversation about seemingly problematic behavior on the shop floor. Hey, I Look, I noticed that you were speaking quite loudly to the intern just before. And, and based on their response, I'm just a little bit worried that they could have found that distressing. Would you be willing to share with me what was going on for you there? You could also use it to address someone's exemplary behavior. Hey, I noticed you seemed really calm during that resuscitation. And I thought that was really impressive. Would you be willing to share with the team what enabled you to do that? It could also function as your first step in a process of graded assertiveness. I can see that you're really keen to induce and intubate this patient as soon as possible. I'm just worried 
that if we do that before we've fluid resuscitated them, they could arrest. Can you just help me understand your reasoning? Of course, if you do use advocacy inquiry as your first step in greater assertiveness, you'll need to have a few other steps to go to if that doesn't work. In this video, I discuss two key models of greater assertiveness currently in the academic literature and why I think one of them is clearly more effective than the other. Take care and I'll see you next time.